story really starts on the day that World War II started, when the Germans invaded Poland, and the Chappelle family was in Susnovich, which is near the German border. And when they heard and saw everything that's going on, they really ran, they tried to escape to Wolbrum, where they were originally born, their original family, and Wolbrum wasn't so good. Um, and most of the family then went back to Sosnovich. Um, the family told me that uh, David's father stayed in Wolbrum rather than go back to Sosnovich because he was very close because they had been born in Wolbrum. He was very close with the head of the city and Jews were not allowed to wear beards. That was one of the Nazi requirements and yet the, the head of the town enabled uh, David's father, Benjamin Chappelle, to wear, keep his beard. He was very close with the rub of the town. Unfortunately, they were taken out. Wolbrum, they were, the Nazis, when they came into Wolbrum, were taken out and shot in the forest. And uh, he was very close with the, with the rub. They assumed that he and the rub were probably standing together when they were shot. David went back to Sosnovich, and then when they saw what's happening, the Nazis invading, and starting to take over. So David's mother told David, run. And he ran east to Russia. And he was with the Russians. He was sent to Siberia, which, of course, because he was in Russia, really saved his life. And then a couple of years later, he was stripped when the Russians and the Germans started fighting each other. On the, Russia, the Germans invaded. He was conscripted, conscripted into the Polish division of the Russian army. So he was not part of the Polish underground, but everything that was going on around him um, in Poland, that's what we're going to hear about. Um, and David and the family, they survived. David, his brother, sister, uh, they all survived, um, made their way after the war to Germany, ironically. Um, I asked why to Germany. It's because Germany was the safest place for Jews after World War II. <clears throat> because it was an occupation by the Americans and the Western Europeans. So they, they literally, most many, many Jews went to Germany, and that's where um, David met his wife, Fela, she should be well. They got married, um, but when Fela became pregnant, she said, I refuse to have my child born on German soil. I refuse to have my child have Germany uh, in her passport. And she basically convinced David to leave Germany, and they went. They had a, they had a relatives in Detroit, and they got into America. And the rest is the history that we're not going to talk about. Our focus here is on the Holocaust. We're very honored to have with us Yehuda Gerber, who was an expert, a historian, and an expert in the Holocaust. And he is going to speak to us about the uh, Jews in the Polish underground. And then afterwards, we'll have a few words to say in tribute to Mr. Chappelle. Thank you for hosting and having the opportunity to be part of such a special uh, evening in honor of Mr. Chappelle and in his memory. And um, and it, it's also interesting that it's uh, for the yard site of Mr. Chappelle, I understand. And it was just recently, last week, we had International Holocaust Day. So the two kind of coincide. There are two different calendars. The yard site goes on the Jewish calendar and International Holocaust Day follows the, the Gregorian calendar. But it, they seem to be around the same time of year, and therefore it's, uh, it's not a coincidence. If we commemorate January 27, 1945, was the day that Auschwitz was liberated by the Russian Red Army. And uh, that was chosen by most countries of the world to be uh, the day internationally to remember the Holocaust. And uh, therefore it's, uh, it's an appropriate time to talk about uh, this subject. Um, what I'm going to discuss a little bit is related to, uh, indirectly related to the story that the Chappelles went through because it's talking about Jewish resistance in the area of Poland. Of course, Mr. Chappelle did what, what, what uh, the Rashiva mentioned and we'll hear uh, later is that he was actually serving in the Polish division of the Russian army, which many Jews did, by the way. Many Jews who had escaped to Russia when Russia tried to get all the manpower they could. Um, so anyone who was there, they drafted into the army, and there was a half a million Russian Jews in the Red Army, and then there was all these Polish Jews in the Polish division in the Red Army, and they 
they served as fighters. The Jews were not only victims during the Holocaust, they were fighters in the Allied armies. Of course, I'm sure some of your great-grandparents or grandparents may have served in the United States oh. Army or the British Army, and the same thing goes for the uh, Russian Red Army as well. What I want to take it is to step back. The Allied armies are coming in from the outside, but uh, we assume that any of the Jews who are directly under Nazi occupation they were victims, and they may have gone like sheep to slaughter. And uh, and uh, really, the the uh, the story is a little bit more nuanced than that. And I want to talk about different types of resistance, specifically in the Nazi-occupied Poland. Why Poland? Why Poland more than any other country? We could have talked about France or Holland or Belgium or Italy or Yugoslavia or Greece or Russia or. I mean, the Nazis unfortunately occupied the entire continental Europe pretty much during World War II. And Poland is for several reasons. On a technicality, Sosnovich is in Poland, so the Chappelle's uh, make it related to that. But more than that, the Jews in pre-war Europe, Poland had the largest uh, population in the entire uh, in the entire Europe, second to largest in the world. The United States already had the largest Jewish population in the world, but uh, in Poland. There was three and a half million Jews, and uh, they made 10% of the population. And besides the state of Israel today, there has never been a country in Jewish history that 10% of the population was Jewish. Uh, in the city, and Jews were always an urban population, so you're talking about a third of the major cities, Warsaw, Lodz, Krakow, Lvov, uh, Lublin, a third of the population was Jews, one out of three people. So they were very much there. and. And 90% uh, of Polish Jews were wiped out. So do the math. Uh, Six million Jews were uh, murdered in the Holocaust. Three million of those were Polish Jews. So we're talking, half of the victims of the Holocaust were Polish Jewry. So the story of where the Holocaust takes place is primarily in Poland. And therefore, when we discuss the resistance, even though there was Jewish the stories of Jewish resistance in all the countries that I mentioned uh, earlier, but I'm going to focus on Poland. And there's different types of resistance. What does resistance mean? I want to start off with a question like that. Um, what is resistance during the Holocaust and what makes it Jewish? It could be, we have to first define what exactly resistance might be, and resistance could be anyone. It could also be non Jews. Again, if it's Nazi occupied Europe, then I'm sure the French weren't excited about the fact that the Nazis were in their country, so there would be French resistance. And the Poles were not exactly excited. That the Nazis were occupying Poles, there would be Polish resistance. So, what makes something uniquely Jewish about that Jewish resistance? So, resistance can be in many forms. There can be uh, resistance by fighting. I take a rifle and I resist the occupation. I don't want them to be there and I fight them. So, that's I'm resisting it. I don't want the Nazis to be there. On the other hand, I can also resist in other ways. I can resist by defying the Nazi occupation. In their occupation, they promulgate certain decrees, certain laws. By defying that, by going against it, by making it difficult for them, by showing that I'm still there and I have my own identity, then I'm resisting the Nazi occupation. So in that case, we have very specifically Jewish types of resistance because they can have a, if the, if the Nazis want to destroy the Jewish spirit, and I, if I go ahead and organize a minion, and what we just did in Davin Meyer was a very mundane activity. But uh, just last week was in the news. I just read this article and I got this stuff all the time. But they were doing some uh, excavations and building, really, it wasn't they? Were doing specific excavations. They were they were digging for foundations of a building in Warsaw, and, uh, and lo and behold, they discover one of the bunkers in the Warsaw ghetto. And what do they find in one of the bunkers? Ten pairs of tefillin. So, you know, and, the, and the, those type of things last. So, the, the, there's no reason it should get ruined. So, it's in pretty decent condition after all these years. And this is just fresh news. This just broke a couple of days ago. Now, if you tell me you find one pair of tefillin, so great. So, I know that this was a Jewish bunker in the Warsaw ghetto. I also happen to know that it was probably a traditional or religious Jew. And maybe he even prayed in the bunker. Very nice. If I find 10 pairs of tefillin there, what does that mean? That means they were even conducting minyanim. In the bunker during the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, during when they had almost no air and no food, not only were they still praying, but they were making sure to still pray with a minion. Um, so this is, you know, a phenomenal type of resistance because, because in General Jurgen Stroop, in his 
In his report on the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, in which we have, we have this documentation of today, he calls them rats, he calls them uh, uh, um, all types of, you know, animalistic, dehumanizing uh, type of uh, uh, names that he gives them because he doesn't even consider them human beings. And there's, and he can't, he can't even fathom how they're even fighting back. So not only are they fighting back by fighting, by shooting at his men, but they're also fighting back by saying, we're not rats, we're conducting a minion. You don't let us do it above ground, we'll do it underground. You don't let us do it with an abundance of food and oxygen, we'll do it without food and oxygen. And we're going to continue, so that can be a form of resistance as well. What if I say, you're going to give me impossible conditions, and uh, I'm just going to be in a struggle for survival, but beyond looking for survival, I'm going to look to educate the next generation. And I'm going to establish underground schools in the ghettos. That's a form of resistance. What if the process of the dehumanization that the Nazis are trying to do to destroy the human being is that I only can care for myself. I turn into an animal. I do anything so that I can survive. I'm going to steal. I'm going to push the other guy. I'm going to try to get ahead just so that I can survive. But then I make a conscious decision to give what little I have and share it with others. That could be a form of resistance because you tried to destroy me, you tried to turn me into an animal, and I am not an animal. I'm still a human being. I still have a Jewish identity and I still care for others. In other words, what we have, and again, I can illustrate each one of these examples with many, many stories of, of, of resistance. Um, and, and, and there are those who would even go far as far as to say that just by surviving, by not giving up hope, by not committing suicide, which unfortunately many did, they did give up. And it was very hard to, and it was a big challenge. Um, but, but if I don't, and I want to survive because I believe in a tomorrow, and I believe that one day we'll be free and I'll restart a family and I'll get married and I'll have a, and I'll have a new life, so I'm going to try to survive. That could be a form of resistance because they don't want me to survive. They're trying to, to destroy the Jewish people. So maybe even the very survival can be a, considered a form of resistance. So therefore, we're, when we talk about resistance in general, by definition, where there's a large, it, it's a big, full picture. And what makes these things Jewish? So if it's tefillin, then it's obvious that it's Jewish. But sometimes, even if it's not Phil, and it could be something uniquely Jewish, by a group of Jews getting together to organize an armed resistance. Or something else, which we'll see, other manifestations of it, which we're going to see as we go through the, um, the, the story here uh, of, of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of, of, of how it developed, of how the resistance developed over the time, um, of what made it Jewish, and, uh, and, does it, and, how, and why is that important? And, uh, you know, maybe it's not. We'll find out that it's just enough to resist. It doesn't have to be a uh, Jewish resistance. Um, the other thing that needs to be pointed out is that there's different stages of the, the Holocaust as it develops, especially in a place like Poland, where the occupation lasted six years, whereas other places it was shorter. Uh, there are different stages. The first stage, the Nazis established ghettos, enclosures of in, in, in every city, every town. There's over over a thousand ghettos in Nazi-occupied Europe, primarily in Eastern Europe, Southern Europe a little bit, Central Europe a bit, not in Western Europe, which is the whole story of how ghettos, what was the Nazi uh, policy as far as ghettos are concerned. And uh, they spent a couple of years inside these ghettos. And inside these ghettos, they're living in neighborhoods in their cities with their families, essentially with a limited possibility of finding a job, of, if, if you could, if you have the right connections and the right capabilities, but under very horrifying conditions. In other words, it's not a concentration camp, but the conditions, the physical conditions that they're living under are, are almost impossible to survive in many, in many cases. It's, it's all very limited food, overcrowded conditions, um, disease spreads, Today we're already familiar with what an epidemic is and a pandemic is. You're talking about something like that. Deadly epidemics can spread with typhus and, and other diseases can uh, spread through the non-hygienic conditions of, of the ghetto. And in many ghettos, the, death, the natural death rate, this is before any gas chambers or deportations to death camps take place, the natural death rate was already wiping out the Jewish population. So that's one stage. There's the next stage, 
in the spring of 1942, when the Nazis start the deportations, when they implement the final solution, when they decide that we are going to wipe out the entire Jewish people, men, women, and children, this, an a decision to, of genocide, to just wipe out the Jewish people wherever they are, and the deportations from these ghettos to the death camps begins a new stage. Because now they're going to end up in a death camp. What are those people going to do? How are they going to experience it? There are those that are going to try to not get deported. They're going to try to find hiding places. They're going to try to run to the forest and find places to join the resistance. This is when it takes place. It doesn't usually take place earlier on in the ghetto. And then we have the last stage where there are those who are in hiding. There are those in the forest with the partisans. And there are those who were lucky enough. Lucky enough. They were privileged. They didn't get sent to the gas chambers and the death camps. They got sent to a concentration camp where they only have terrible slave labor, beatings, and starvation. And they are going to try to survive in these concentration camps. So that's already a third stage. So when we talk about the resistance, it has to relate to the context of all those stages. When are we talking about it? What, what's the background? What's the context? What's the framework? When is it? So I'm going to give a few different stories and examples from everything I just uh, introduced, from all the different types of resistance and from the different stages of time, and hopefully we're going to stay focused in Poland itself. I mentioned the death camps, and this is one of the most famous, of course, anything that has a movie always gets more famous. Um, so the, there's, a, there's an escape from the death camp of Sobibor. And when we talk about, let's talk about this idea, you know, we, we grew up, the movie already existed. So in the, in the book, we basically really old fashioned read still. And, uh, and, and, and you, we grew up with it. Yeah, of course, they escaped from Sobibor. It seems like obvious almost. But what exactly was the story there? And it's not obvious at all that such a thing should have taken place altogether. We're talking about a death camp. Now, what's the difference between a death camp and a concentration camp? A death camp is not, I mean, camp is, is a misleading term in this context. It's not a camp. It's a, I would call it a death site, not a death camp. Camp sounds like it, you're there for a long time. The average person, the average Jew who was deported to a death camp wasn't there for more than an hour. And I bring groups. Back in the olden days when there was such a thing called travels, I used to bring groups to Europe and we would tour Eastern Europe and Central Europe, wherever there was Jewish communities through Jewish history. And we would go to places like Sobibor, Treblinka, uh, Belzec, the three big death camps in Eastern Poland, and, uh, and, and I would give the tour and tell the story of the place. And sometimes they'll sing Ani Mamin, and they'll say a Kaddish, and a Kelmole, and, and it's a very powerful experience. And I'll tell the guys at the end of the tour, did anyone notice what time we arrived here? Look at your watches now. We were here right now longer than almost all the victims ever were. Just keep that in mind on our little tour. Because they didn't even have a chance to, to, to understand where they had arrived at. So that's the type of place this is. But... The Nazis did keep a group of Jews there permanently. They were called the Zunderkommando. They were a special, they had the worst job in human history. They were the slave labor in the death camps. And they had to be the ones who sorted out the suitcases of the Jews who arrived there. And they had to be the ones who, the ones who actually had to uh, um, um, be the ones working by the gas chamber themselves. They had to be the ones who uh, did the work, who got, took them off the trains. And they were the witnesses to the final solution. And the Nazis tried to make sure that none of them survived. So, in Sobibor, this group of Jews, they started to notice in the end of 1943, in the summer of 1943, they started to notice that the transports aren't coming in anymore. Because the Nazis had finished the Jews in that area of Poland. Also, Dutch Jews were sent there. There was no more Jews in Holland. And there was no more Jews in that area of Poland. Sobibor had served its purpose, and the Nazis were going to close down the camp. 1943, middle of the war. And, uh, and they realized that if the Nazis close down the camp, then they're going to be the last victims of the camp. So a group of them get together. The what type of people they get together? This is what, this is what the, uh, this is what the, the odds, the, 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 the situation that's, that you could have never dre have dreamed of in normal times brings out at this time. There's a fellow by the name of 
Leon Feldhandler, who's the son of a rabbi. He's an Orthodox Jew. He's the son of a rabbi. And he's the head of the underground, the resistance in the Soviet board death camp. It's the typical head of a resistance that you'll think of, a son of a rabbi, an Orthodox Jew. And he says, we're going to get out. And he has opportunities to escape with his little group of, of people who are involved in the underground, in the resistance. And each time he pushes it off. Why? Because he says we have responsibility to the, all 600 of the members of the Zundu Kramadu. We're not going to escape just for ourselves. We have a responsibility for everyone. Who told him he has a responsibility for everyone? Why should he have a responsibility for everyone? He also realizes that he doesn't know how to get out. He doesn't know, he doesn't have the military experience. Lo and behold, a transport comes in from the Minsk ghetto. Minsk is east. All the other transports were coming from local or the west. Here it's coming from the east, from the Soviet Union. And a transport comes in from the Minsk ghetto. And on this transport, almost everyone is sent, of course, to the gas chambers. But a few who are taken to join the Zunder Commando are a group of prisoners of war. Now, the Nazis, whenever they had prisoners of war, so usually on, in the Eastern Front, they didn't even follow the Geneva Convention. And millions of, of Soviet prisoners of war either died or were killed by the Nazis. That's a different story. But even when they did have... The, the, uh, the idea that they would not kill the prisoners of war, but they would find the Jews who were prisoners of war. In other words, Jews serving in the army, who had surrendered, who were in uniform, military uniforms, they would separate them, which is a war crime, but, you know, the Nazis did a lot of crimes. And they, and they tried to do this for American Jews in the army, by the way, and uh, it was unsuccessful, that's a whole story. But they tried to separate American Jews who were captured during the Battle of the Bulge in the winter of uh, in December 1944. And they were going to separate American Jews in U.S. Army uniforms to send them to the dead because they're Jews. Who cares if they're American? Jews is a race. But they did it for Soviet Jews. And they sent them to Sobibor. And among those Jews was a Soviet communist Jew named Sasha Pachersky. And he's a lieutenant. He's an officer in the Red Army. And he arrives in Sobibor. So here you have, you know, a Soviet communist Jew is not the most religious fellow, but he has the military training. And he's a Russian Jew. And you have Leon Feldhandler, who's an Orthodox Polish Jew. They don't speak the same language. He speaks Polish and Yiddish, and he only speaks Russian and a little bit of German. They have an interpreter speak to <laughs> get the two of them together. And these two people lead the revolt that is so we were. Okay? And, uh, and they, they go ahead and lead this revolt. And, and, uh, and, they, and, they, and it's one of the most successful revolts of any uh, camp, uh, uh, prisoner of war, slave labor, concentration camp, death camp. It is one of the most successful revolts of the entire World War II on any front, in any place. Done by who? By a bunch of Jews in a death camp. And um, 300 of them get out to the forests, and um, close to 50 survived the war. 47 survived the war. How do they survive? They join. Once they get to the forest, they join the partisans. They join the resistance. There are active resistance uh, groups working in the forest. Around that area was called the Parchev Forest. Parchev was a city in Poland, not far from Sobibor. It was actually an important shtetl. There were a lot of people who lived there before the war. And, um, and they, they joined. There was two Jewish partisan groups uh, in, active in, in the Parchev during that time. One was a fellow by the name of Samuel Gruber. His nickname, they always had code names because they got caught. They couldn't uh, uh, be tortured and try to find others, so his code name was Miatek, and there was a second guy who had another group named Chil Grinshpa, and his name was Chil, and they had both had military training, they were corpor corporals in the Polish army uh, before the war, and at the out war's outset, and they organized uh, Jewish partisan groups. Now they tried to join the Polish resistance, it would be more successful. The Polish resistance had a very powerful underground called the Armia Krayoya, Krayoya, I'm for sure pronouncing it incorrectly. Um, and uh, there were Jews who served in the Polish resistance. However, Armia Krayoya, the AK, we'll call them, because that's how everyone called them, was very anti Semitic. 
think about how counterintuitive this is. You're both fighting the Nazi occupation. <laughs> you know, join forces. That's what would make the most sense. But sometimes anti-Semitism trumps the the logic and the and the uh, and 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 what what should what should be the rational way of doing things. And these Jewish partisan groups spend half their energy, time, and bullets fighting off the Polish resistance who was trying to get rid of them in the forest instead of fighting them, instead of both of them uniting together to fight the Nazis. And sometimes the Polish resistance who was busy fighting the Nazis took off time from fighting the Nazis to, to uh, turn them in, to tell them, hey, we know that there's a, Pol a Jewish resistance group in the forest down there, you might want to get them. We're also fighting you, but we'll wait till you, know, you take care of the Jews to, 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 to continue. So the relationship with the non-Jewish resistance groups is, is a bit complicated. Um, there was a Polish communist uh, resistance. That was the uh, P PK or something like that. I forget the, uh, the exact, um, it's, it's not important. Um, just like there was Polish divisions in the Red Army, so, so Stalin also supported Polish communist resistance groups, and those did accept Jews. Ironically, the communists were the ones who were more accepting, as were Soviet partisans. When Stalin declared the partisan war at the end of the summer of 1941, following the German invasion, he, 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 he ordered that all Soviet soldiers who were stuck behind the lines should organize into battalions of partisans. The Soviet Air Force would come and, and, and airdrop weapons to them, and the Soviet partisans organized themselves in the forest. Stalin said, Anyone who comes to the forest, if they're capable of holding a rifle, you must allow them to join your, your, your partisan group. Jews started to run to the forest. Soviet partisans were required to accept them. Not that there wasn't anti-Semitism by the Soviet partisans, but there at least they could get accepted and, uh, and fight alongside the Soviets. So there were Jews who fought with the Soviet partisans, and to a limited extent also with the Polish resistance, uh, with the, the, especially with the communists, the Polish communists, and to a lesser extent with the AK, the main uh, Polish resistance. But we're going to get into more of those details later. I want to bring out another story, which is similar to the Sobibor story, yet in so many, so many ways it's different than the Sobibor story. There was a place that today is in Belarus, which is another country, but in those days it was still considered Poland. Poland's borders changed over the years. The towns themselves didn't move. It's that the borders changed. We know there's a, an old joke about a Jew who said that... Uh, he was born in a town in Romania, and his, he went to school in Czechoslovakia, and his bar mitzvah took place in Ukraine, and he got married in Russia, and he never left the town that he was born in his entire life. So that's, uh, that's, that's, that's what happened in those parts of Europe at the time. The borders changed. So there was a town called, in Yiddish they called it Navarduk. In Polish and Russian it was called Novogrudok. And it was famous because it had a world-renowned Musser yeshiva there. Rabbi Yosef Yosef Horowitz had the Novartic stream of Musser when he opened it in the town in 1896. And there was also a very prominent rabbi, Rabbi Chiel Michal Halevi Epstein, who wrote a very, very important halachic work, the Aruch HaShulchan. It was a very, very important Jewish town, large Jewish population. So when we ever we talk about Novartic, we talk about the Musser of Novartic. We talk about the Aruch HaShulchan. There was also a very important story that took place during World War II in Novartic. Novartic had several thousand Jews living there during, at, the, at, the, at the beginning of the war. Over 6,000 Jews, about 7,000 Jews were living there at the war's outset. And there in the area that's considered the east, eastern part of Poland, which was incorporated into the Soviet Union. So the Nazi policy in the east was not to deport anyone to death camps, to concentration camps. That only took place in Poland and Western Europe and Southern Europe. In the east, in Russia, what they would do is they would march the Jews simply out of the town. They would have them dig their own graves, and they would have them shot and killed in a very terrible and horrifying and cruel way into those graves by SS units known as Einsatzgruppen. And, uh, and that's how the Jews in the east, in the Soviet Union, were killed during the Nazi occupation. And the Jews of the Arctic fared the same way. And it went in several massacres over the war, over the occupation. There were four massacres of the Jews of the Arctic and the surrounding towns. Thousands and thousands of Jews were killed. And the population keeps on shrinking in the Novartic ghetto. And it's until the beginning, it was, it was they, they killed off the leadership and the, and the intelligentsia and the, the 
leadership, the important people of the community, to weaken the internal structure of the Jewish community. Later on, they took all the people who couldn't work, elderly, sick, children. Later on, they took only skilled workers they allowed to live, and it keeps on shrinking. And from these thousands and thousands of Jews who lived in Navarrek, we come to the end of 1943, and, uh, and, and we're up to only a couple of hundred Jews left, locked up in the courthouse in the center of Navarrek, surrounded by barbed wire. These are the skilled workers under starvation rations, just enough to keep them alive, to keep working until they don't need them anymore. And they suspected that that time would be coming soon, September 1943, the Nazis are in a, um, are, 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 uh, are, uh, are, um, uh, what escapes me? What happens when you live here too long? You forget English and Hebrew. You don't know evil language. That they they were already uh, uh, um, retreating. Thank you. Uh, they were retreating after February first, nineteen forty-three. Uh, um, uh, uh, the surrender at Stalingrad. The Sixth Army surrender at, uh, uh, at, at uh, Stalingrad. Polis. Uh, find your Polis. Anyway, um, surrenders the Sixth Army of Stalingrad, and now they are retreating through Eastern Europe. The Red Army is pushing them back. So the last Jews in Novartic who had smuggled a radio into the courthouse, incredibly enough, are now organizing a resistance. What's going to be their resistance? So they think, let's try and rush against the, the guards around the courthouse, and we'll force the front gate open, and if you Jews might get killed, but we'll kill some SS along the way, and we'll be able to get out and run to the forest. What's in the forests around Novartic? First of all, there are Soviet parties. There's a thick, thick forest near Novartic called the Nalaboki Forest. And the Nalaboki Forest had a lot of Soviet partisans active there. Who would accept them? If they're fighters, they'll accept you. But in the Nalaboki Forest, there was something even more important. There was the greatest Jewish partisan unit in the entire World War II. It was the Bielski brothers were active in the Nalabaki forest. Tovio Bielski, Zisul Bielski, Asoyal Bielski, and Aaron Bielski, who was still alive. The youngest brother was still alive. He was 14 when he became a partisan with his brothers in the forest. And he's living in Miami today. He's in his 90s. Um, so so they, they, uh, they have this partisan group, which is not just to fight the Nazis. Tovio Bielski said, our first and primary Objective is to save other Jews. We're going to save other Jews, and we're also going to fight the Nazis. That's the resistance, the Jewish resistance. And again, when I said, what makes things uniquely Jewish? The Soviet partisans made it very clear. We're fighting the Nazis. You can't hold a rifle. We feel terrible. Don't join our unit. We can't provide you with anything. Uh, we're not here to, to save people. We're here to fight the Nazis. We're soldiers. And... Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and Tobi Bielski said, we're also fighting the Nazis, and we're going to derail trains, and we're also trained soldiers, and they had a very impressive fighting unit. But our primary objective is to save other Jews. And in the Bielski family camp, there are babies, children, elderly, sick, men, women. They made a deal with the Soviet partisans in the area. They said, your proportion of fighters to non-fighters is higher than ours, so you're a more impressive fighting unit. So you can help us with protection, along with our own fighting unit, but we can provide something for you that you don't have on your own. We can do laundry, we can cook food, we can fix weapons, we can uh, maintain supplies. Ah, you guys are big fighters, but you can't do all these they're living in the forest for three years. They need a lot of logistics arranged. You know what I mean? And they do that. And it's actually a deal that Tobi Bielski strikes with the Soviet partisans that the Jews, these, the ones who aren't fighters, they provide for the Soviet partisans. And it's a relationship that for the most part, there were exceptions over the two and a half to three years in the forest, but for the most part, it works out. And, the, and Tobi Bielski, he was so eager to save other Jews is that he wouldn't just suffice by... Uh, waiting for Jews to come to him and allowing them to join his family camp, he would send emissaries to the ghettos nearby, to Navardik, to Lida, to, to, to Baranovich, to, to all the ghettos in that area, and he would send 
And he'd say, leave the ghetto. If you stay in the ghetto, you're going to get killed. Come join me. I'll provide for you. I'll take care of you. Amazing. So the Novartic people wanted to join either the Soviet partisans or the Bielskis. And, and what happens is, is that, is that they feel that the armed resistance, the, the uh, revolt against the Nazis is not going to work. The conditions don't allow for it. So what do they do instead? They dig a tunnel. It's amazing that there's no movie been made about this story. September 26, 1943, they go out of a tunnel that's 250 meters long. How much is 250 meters? That's, that's uh, it's a few football yeah, fields. Half a mile. And these people dug it without tools on starvation rations when they're in slave labor all day. So after they were done their slave labor and they had their slice of bread with a cup of water, they spent the night, instead of sleeping, digging a tunnel and finding places to hide the soil. Okay, so they built false walls to hide the soil. And they dig the tunnel, and it's just enough for one person at a time to go through. So if you had a claustrophobic, you did not want to be involved in this escape plan. And they went 250 meters. September 26, 1943, they called the crawl through. Now before that, there were those in the camp who did not, they thought it wasn't a good idea. So again, how does Jewish resistance work? The people who organized, it was a small group, everyone knew about it. The people who organized, the ones who were strong enough and able enough to have the initiative to organize, they said, we're going up. What do we care? They said, no, we're in this together. We're, we're 230 people here. We're in this together. You know what they did? They took a vote. And with the democracy, they took a vote. Who votes to use the tunnel? They just spent three months building this tunnel to get out. But they heard that some aren't, they think it's too risky, it's going to risk other people's lives, we're going to vote. And if the majority votes against it, we're not going to use it. They voted. Okay? We have testimonies from this. A lot of people survived this escape. We know exactly what happened. 165 voted to use the tunnel, and 65 voted against. Okay? And they said, oh, that's a clear majority, it's a super majority, it's enough to even remove people from office. And you are able, and they went ahead and they used the tunnel, they escaped to the forest, and uh, 170 made it to the forest. So proportionally, that's more than the escape from Soviet Republic. It's about 75% made it to the forest. It's an incredibly <laughs> successful escape. In these type of escapes, you expect that uh, maybe uh, you know 10% survive, 20% survive. And here's 75% made it to the forest, most of them with the Bielski. Partisans and many of them actually survived the war. I had the privilege of interviewing a lady. She's about that high. She's 99 years old, has a perfect recall. She had more energy than me and, 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 my, and my three kids put together. She was incredible. She, she, as soon as I came in, she made me a coffee and I got out and then she talked and she talked and she did and she stood up and she walked around four hours. I interviewed her and, and, uh, Amazing, she lives in Israel. Amazing woman. Uh, um, so she was one of those who was part of this escape to the tunnel and the Bielski partisans, and that's Jewish resistance, my friends. So the um, uh, if we move along, uh, that's that's a, a, another story. Um, we're going to go on another few examples. There was we know everyone heard about the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. I'm not going to talk about that, especially it's the ghettos. We want to talk more about the resistance after the ghettos. But many of the, uh, a group of fighters from the Warsaw Ghetto, there's a fellow by the name of Marek Edelman. Marek Edelman was a Bundist. The Bund was a Jewish socialist party. They believed in socialism, in Jewish autonomy, and in secular Yiddish culture. They were anti-religious and anti-Zionist. So that was a, now, and they were the biggest Jewish political party in Poland before the war, believe it or not. Very successful. They also, a lot of the religious Jews liked them. Why? anti-religious, because they fought anti-Semitism, because they wanted to fight for equal rights in Poland. So they, 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 if you lost your job, listen to this, this is the Polish Jewry before the war, it's hard to understand this in 2021. Uh, if you lost your job because you refused to work on Shabbos, you were a textile factory worker in Lodz before the war, and you lost your job because you refused to come in to work on Shabbos, that's religious discrimination. So who'd you hire? You know, if you hire the Zionist, uh, Zionist lawyer to represent you, they'll tell you, no, you should move to Palestine. You, 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 we have no future here in Poland. What are, you, what, are you, what are you even fighting for? 
So you hire the Bundes lawyer, and he's going to fight for your rights because we need equal rights and no anti-Semitism, no religious discrimination. Now the guy doesn't believe in Shabbos. He doesn't want to keep Shabbos, but he's going to fight for your rights. So it's an interesting paradox, these Bundes. Either way, Marek Edelman was a 23-year-old uh, Bundes in the Warsaw Ghetto, and he's one of the heads of the resistance and one of the major uh, leaders of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, one of the ones who survived. He crawls through the sewers. He's described how he was 48 hours with a group of fighters during the last days of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising in sewage up to his nose. 48 hours. Okay, until someone rescued them from the sewers. And they come out on the other side of Warsaw at the end of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. Now what? They joined the Polish resistance. They were the ones who were successful at joining the AK, as anti-Semitic as they were. What happens? The Polish resistance, a year later, in August of 1944, they staged their uprising, the Warsaw Uprising. This is way after the Warsaw Ghetto. There's no more Warsaw Ghetto. There's no more, almost no Jews in Warsaw, except in hiding or in the resistance. And the and the, the Polish resistance stages an uprising against the Nazi occupation in Warsaw. And the Polish resistance, uh, along with them, is Marek Edelman and his friends. Not only that, but the Polish resistance liberates a small concentration camp that the Nazis had established on the ruins of the Warsaw Ghetto where Jewish slave labor was being used. So you have the liberation of a, of a concentration camp in the middle of Warsaw, in the middle of the war, by the Polish resistance. Very odd situation. And they say, come out and join our, our, our uprising. So you have Jewish concentration camp survivors from Warsaw. You have Marek Edelman and his survivors of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. And they're part of the Polish uprising. And that's Jewish resistance. Why is it Jewish resistance? Because they became one of what was called the Robinson Crusoes of Warsaw. Nice title, right? What's the Robinson Crusoes of Warsaw? The Nazis crushed the Warsaw Uprising after 63 days of fighting. Not the Warsaw Ghetto. Again, I'm talking about the Polish Uprising later. And they gave an order, they gave an order that Himmler, Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS, gave an order that the city of Warsaw should be wiped off the face of the map. And they simply went, they exiled everyone from the city, they emptied out the city, all Polish civilians, all Polish fighters, had to leave the city, and they are destroying the city. They went with flamethrowers and tanks and artillery and dynamite, and they blew up. There's nothing left of Warsaw at the end of the war. It's one of, probably the most destroyed city at the end of World War II. Now, the Jews knew that if they would go through the German lines to leave the city as civilians, these last few Jewish fighters, they might be identified as Jews. So they decide they're staying in the city. And they come to be known as the Robinson. If anyone saw the pianist, Vladislav Spielmann did the same exact thing for the same reason. Because he didn't want to be identified as a Jew escaping the city. And so they decide to stay in the city. And they stay there hiding out in Warsaw. So they become the last fighters of Warsaw. As ironically, the Jewish fighters. Because they don't want to leave the city. And they stay there till the very end. Um, now, the, there's a, a question that has to be asked when we talk about this type of resistance. Is how do we measure success? Is success measured by very linear terms? If I save this amount of people, then that's success. Maybe, even not, maybe not even that. If the goal, who says the goal is saving people's lives? If I killed a certain amount of Nazis, or I derailed a certain amount of Nazi supply trains that are going to the Eastern Front, then that's success. If I got killed, and if the resistance failed, then that's a failure. How do we define success? And the answer to that question is something I don't know. I don't know the answer. But I want to bring out another story that shows how complicated the situation is. Because we have to understand, we talk about this, a few of these stories, we have to understand how hopeless the situation was for the Jews of Poland. Remember, 90% of them were wiped out. It's not that these resistance stories were so successful. The Jews of Novartic who left was after four massacres when there was almost no Jews left in Novartic. And the Jews of Sobibor who escaped was after 250,000 Jews were gassed in Sobibor. So the idea that resistance was like, hey, this is the same. Oh, this guy came I went to this lecture and this guy who says he, who says he gave tours in Europe and worked in Yad Vashem, he, he sounded like he knows what he's talking about. And he told us all these stories of resistance, the Holocaust. Sounds like it wasn't that bad after all. That's not the point. The point was is that is that resistance was very complicated. Anyone who went ahead and tried to do any of these stuff was putting a lot on the line. And it wasn't so simple. Now here's a story that brings it out more than any other. 
there is a small little tiny labor camp not far from Lublin called Yanishov. You never heard of it. It's a tiny little camp. And if not for this story, we would have never have heard of it. There are 600 prisoners in the camp. Very small. Jewish prisoners. And it's November 6, 1942. Most of the ones we spoke about are much later. 1942. November 6, 1942. 18 partisans from the forest nearby. Most of them Jewish. Jewish partisans. A few Polish partisans. Again, we have cases where they're working together. They break into the camp. They break into a concentration, a labor camp. Nazi SS labor camp. They kill the SS officers in charge. Partisans, they've got rifles. They open the barracks and they say, Yidin Ratvitzich, Jews, go save yourselves. Run for your lives. This is one of the only instances that we know of of a camp being liberated. We talk about liberation, it's the US Army, the Russian Army. We spoke about a very interesting case during the Warsaw Uprising that their Polish resistance liberated again. Here we have a wild situation where it's during the war, under Nazi occupation, and we have a liberation of a camp of Jews by Jews. Jewish partisans are liberating a camp. Unbelievable. And they're now they're free. What do they do with their freedom? They all run. Most of them. Some of them stayed. They didn't know where to go. And they run to the forest, they run to find hiding places. Within days, for some of them a couple of months, almost all of them are killed. The Nazis find them, they starve, there's nowhere to hide, there's nowhere to go. The SS are looking for them, the Gestapo, the Polish resistance is not so friendly, there's anti-Semites who turn them in, and they're all gone. He's liberated. How do we even know this story? There was a Jew named Label Musikant. And he was one of those prisoners who were liberated in Yanishov on that night. And he successfully joins the partisans. And a few days later, he is sent by his group of about 30 partisans to go get some food from the village. He goes to the village, his rifle, he's a partisan, and he gets some food. And he goes back to the partisans inside the forest. When he arrives there, he discovers that the Nazis have found them and they're all killed. So he's alone in the forest. Now what? Do you know what Label did? There was another slave labor camp called Budzin nearby. He goes to Budzin. I'm not making this up because Label survived the war and he told us the story. And he knocks on the door and he says, I'm a Jew. Can, can you let me in? Budzin. Concentration camp. And the SS lets him in. And he goes into the concentration camp. And though many did not survive Budzin, it was a horrible place, and it was very hard to survive a concentration camp in general, but some did, and Label did. So we have an incredible situation. The liberated Jews who were free did not survive the war. The one who was free and liberated and turns himself in to the concentration camp survives the war. What, what we try to bring out here is, A, the hopelessness of the situation that the Polish Jews found themselves in at this time, that you could not know what was the better decision to do. You could not know what's the right way to go. And it was completely dependent on the Siyat the Shnaya, on God's Hashgacha, on, on whether you're supposed to live or die. You can never know that this is the right decision to make or the incorrect decision. You don't know. You do your best. You best, according to your reading of the situation, you try to resist, you try to get out, you try to fight back, but you have no idea if what you're going to do is going to be more successful than what the next guy did. That's a very important point to, to bring out. And I want to end off with just uh, um, one or two last stories. The you talk about, I mentioned the Feldhandler was Orthodox, so you usually associate fighting and armed resistance with, uh, with any type of Jew. It doesn't necessarily, it usually means not necessarily an Orthodox Jew. We have a very interesting story of a Hasidic Rebbe who led a resistance, an armed revolt. Quite a rare story. 
in one of the lar- one of the large Polish Hasidus, uh, Hasidic dynasties in pre-war Poland was Radzin. There was earlier on in the mid nineteenth century there was a a fellow by the name of of um, Rabbi Mordechai Yosef Liner, who was a close student of the Kutzker, Menachem Mendel Morgenstern of Kutzk, and he left Kutzk in a whole story, and he founds the new Hasidic dynasty of Ishbitz. And his descendants moved to a town called Radzin, not far away, and this a large Polish Hasidus, Radzin. They, they were the first ones to bring Tcheles back into, back into style, um, and they were renowned for quite a few things. The last Radzin Rebbe was named Rabbi Shmuel Shlomo Liner, a direct descendant from the Ishbitzer, and he is in the town of Lod- Lodwa, in eastern Poland, not far from Sobibor, by the way. And he says, the Nazis are out to kill us. We have to fight back. This Hasidic Rebbe. And he says, we have to escape from the ghetto and not listen to the Nazi orders to gather in the area. They're going to deport us to our deaths. We have to fight back. And we're going to go to the forests. And we're going to get weapons. And we're going to fight. And that's exactly what happened. He didn't get weapons, but during his escape to the forest and while he was trying to organize his Hasidim to make a resistance group, the Rebbe unfortunately was killed. But that is a, an initiative that we think usually associate the resistance and fighting back with, with the, uh, you know, the more militant youth groups of the Bund, of the Zionists. And here we have a Hasidic Rebbe who's taking that initiative. But like I started off with, their spiritual resistance was something that was very prevalent uh, at this time as well. And sometimes it was that resistance that actually inspired. We know from testimonies in the Ring of Love Archive in the Warsaw Ghetto that, that some of the stories that inspired the Warsaw Ghetto uprising was actually of religious Jews who had shown spiritual resistance, defiance in the face of the Nazis that said, hey, we don't have to go down just like that. We can be like them. They did it through sanctifying God's name and a spiritual way. We're going to do it through fighting. So they're actually the inspiration for it. And I want to share with you one of the most powerful stories that I often repeat on my trips that is that was used in that context. There was a Hasidic Jew, a Gera Hasid, the largest uh, Polish Hasidus before the war, who was uh, arguably the largest. And uh, and uh, and his name was Shlomo Zelachowski. Shlomo Zelachowski was in a town called um, you know, and in the town of the it was May 1942, and I'm going to read from the text, from the testimony that we have. In May 1942, on the eve of the Jewish festival of Shavuot, the Germans hanged 10 Jews in the market square in Zdunskivola, including the pious Gerachasid Shlomo Zalachowski. According to eyewitness accounts, Zalachowski told his fellow Jews that they should be happy to have the chance to die for the sanctification of the name. On their last night, he led them. Remember, this is Shavuos night. This is not Yom Kippur. What does he decide to do? He led them in the Yom Kippur prayers and suggested that they say the concluding service, the Ne'ilah, just before the Germans led them to the gallows. As the Jewish population of the town stood and watched, Zalachowski went to his death singing his Jewish prayers. Let us sing, Jews. To die like a Jew is such an honor. We are blessed. We die for our people, for the sanctification of the name. It is our great merit to hang on the gallows. Let us sing, Jews. Let's sing a tune. And that's how he went to his death. And it was these stories that there are literally thousands of them that formed the basis of the spiritual resistance that went in hand in hand very often with the armed resistance in its many ways uh, during that terrible, terrible time. Thank you.